Absolutely. Nearly 100k on YouTube now, man. Have you hit it yet? No, not yet. We're like... Touch very, a distance. Yeah, Touch a distance. Very close, man. It's quite good for like... Mm. A year and a half? Not bad, man. So I would keep it like about this far from your mouth. When, 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 when we start. Which we'll start now. <laughs> <laughs> So how you doing, man? Welcome to Fight Island, bro. Yeah, man. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Obviously, like, this has been the dream. Ever since the Fight Island cards were announced, I always wanted to fight on the Fight Islands cards. I remember I messaged Jack after his fight was announced on Fight Island. I was just literally sending a message saying, I'm so jealous, like, I really wanted to go. Um, I hate you, and loads of messages, and he was laughing. And then, obviously, um, this opportunity came around. I thought it would have been Vegas, and then the Fight Island thing came up, and... Living the dream. It is even better, right? 100%. So has it met your expectations? Like, obviously, you're now in the middle of a UFC fight week. Mm. Like, has, how has that met your expectations? Yeah, like a lot of things I didn't really think about before. So, like, I never really thought about how... Well, about a lot of it, to be honest. It's just stuff you never really think about. Um, I, I can't even think of what I'm trying to say now, but, <laughs> like... There's just certain things we've had had to do that I wouldn't have thought about. Obviously, the COVID testing is something I expected, but like the trifecta stuff, sorting all the meals out and um, like sorting the supplements and then like sort of trying to sort your press conference and stuff out and then sort of what times you need to be everywhere and sorting out your gym times and stuff. It's just all stuff I'd sort of, I didn't understand how they were going to do it before and now I see it as perfectly... It's makes good, sense right? yeah it's awesome meals. they look like really well organized make that they, they taste awesome as well like i didn't know i was going to be but um obviously they it's it's also awesome really helps with the cut um i saw you having some problems with your microwave though <laughs> <laughs> that was when they delivered it actually man when they, uh, they delivered it in print in, we didn't know what was going on he just knocked the door and walked in with a hazmat suit on and a microwave i was like oh hi <laughs> He's hitting pads as well. Were you? Yeah, he's hitting pads in, 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 in the room and the doorbell started going off. So we just like flicked the glove off onto the door and he just rocked him in the microwave like <laughs> <laughs> he's just ripping him. <laughs> oh, that's quality, mate. So have you like had a chance to like bump into anybody? Like have you like I'm gonna start asking like the obvious yeah. questions, man, because I'm trying to put myself in like your yeah. position. And if I was here in five week, man, I think I'd be starstruck here and there like do you feel any of that or is it not, not? i think because i've trained with team alpha mill for so long and obviously you you i remember like the first day i turned up um cody garbrandt prism around me escorted me down the mat and introduced me to everyone like um that was when he he had the the bantamweight championship so it was like a surreal thing and he introduced himself even though like everybody knew who he was yeah. um so like since then I, I try not to fangirl too much but i've seen like max holloway at the pool um, we've seen Condit uh, earlier. Um, I've seen like a like Andre and a couple others. I think it was Andre. Um, but it's like you just sort of like look at them, like oh shit, look who it is, like yeah. and without pointing. And then yeah, yeah. you want to go up and say hello and stuff. But it's just one of them things. They're in fight week. I'm in fight week. Um, so after they fight, maybe I'll say hello, have a photo. But until then, it's just stay clear and just act cool. Yeah, no, nah, makes sense. What about Dana White though? I haven't seen him yet. Seen no, him? no, you yeah. If that's someone you would be starstruck by. Nah. Do you not think? Nah, I am. Um, I'm quite cool at all. Like when I met your and all, I wasn't really starstruck. I just sort of like roll with it quite well. And then afterwards, just like oh shit, like I actually met so and so. But I think like because we get to see him at um that the um the pre-fight meetings, don't we? Do you know? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure. So obviously, um, I get a chance to see him. But yeah, it's just could, see the boss. When I like. I, I thought I'd be starstruck everywhere I was looking, man. And, and when I first came, it wasn't really like that. But then the only time I ever did feel starstruck was when I saw Dana. He's just got like a, a real presence mm. about him. I think after you do such a good job of like your fight, and like he, was, he would like come up to you and like compliment you on your fight. I can imagine like, mm. that's the kind of like thing I'd be like striving for, not fighting for his approval. I but, understand. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's part of the business, do you mean? As soon as I um, put a statement on when I fight, mm. that'll just be the next part. So, like, my old goal in this isn't isn't just to win fights. My old goal is to win fights convincingly, and and like that I'm going to show that on Wednesday night. I'm, I'm well next Wednesday, mm. a week today. So um, I'm really looking forward to it. Mm. You're coming out of Cage Warriors as well, for those that don't know, as a double champ. Double champ. Following in like Dan Hardy's footsteps, yeah. McGregor's footsteps. Yeah psychologically how's that how what's that like because you are literally on the same road sat in the same seat on the same coach going to the same place do you know what i mean as mm. those two guys 
I don't really think about it like that. Like, I always think about it as writing my own story and walking my own footsteps and sort of forging my own path. And I'm not going to do things the same way Dan Hardy did his or McGregor did his. I'm I'm just going to try and do me and I'm just going to do the best job I can. And that all starts with putting on a performance of the night on Wednesday. Um, that's, what, that's what matters to start. And then um, we can build it up around there. But... I live this life like this is this is a short-term goal for me. This isn't something I saw falling into. This is something I've always pre-planned for. And this is something that I always knew was going to happen. Um, so it's just sort of it's quite nice to sort of start getting places now. And um, like I've said it before multiple times, like this is the start of the mountain for me because it's the hardest part of the climb now. You really start to hit the steep slopes, and it's so easy to slip and fall, but it's so easy to gain traction as well. Yeah. It's just all that matters is rolling through fight by fight, and like this is going to be a busy year for me. I'm going to start with Mike Date Davis, and I'm going to have a role this year, and you you're really going to see what I can do. And like coming from the the Cage Warrior stuff, like I said to Dan on the plane, actually, like the Champ Champ stuff wasn't planned. Like I just sort of fell into it. Um, I needed an opponent. Adam Proc didn't have an opponent. I like that matchup, and um, I wanted someone who would prove that I could deal with UFC lightweights. And a UFC lightweight to me was Adam Proctor. Adam Proctor was six foot three. Um, I think he was sitting by the time we fought at about 88, 90 kilos. So we had a bit of a weight advantage. So I knew I, if if I beat him and I beat him in fashion, then there was no one at lightweight they could say was oh he's too big or he's he's too good at this or good at that. Like he was on a seven fight win streak, and I put him away in four and a half minutes. Oh, that's smart man. That's really smart. Very cool. I um. I was on Instagram after you won your uh, double belt, and uh, <laughs> and uh, I was I was oh, I was gonna say I was taken back. I wasn't. I was laughing my head off, man. <laughs> it's basically I know. It's basically like a sex photo. Yeah. Me and my missus, yeah, yeah. Um, so that was more to do with like the first fight we did one. Um, after after the photo, we the after the fight after the first fight we did one as well. So after the first fight we did one. Uh, they sort of sat in my lap. Um, sort of sat on my lap. Yeah, um, like naked with a belt on. Um, and we took a photo and chucked it up. And then um, we did one after the champ champ stuff. But a lot of people missed the first one. And because the second one, um, the quote was, um, had to do it a second time. So people have automatically assumed meant we shagged twice on that night. But it wasn't nothing to do with that. It was just to do with like doing a second photo. Because like, like someone asked me this question before and I was like, well, the walls were paper thin. All my, my coaches were next door. Like, I wouldn't really care about my family, but, like, with my coaches and stuff there, it was a bit weird. Like, they were um, they were celebrating. They were having a couple of beers. And, um, uh, yeah, and um, it was just sort of, like, it wouldn't have really bothered me, but it would have made some of my coaches uncomfortable because some of my coaches are a bit more prudish than we are. So we was like, oh, we can't. So she was a bit, so, yeah. But it was just a photo, man. But it, it, was, it was a cool photo. Yeah, was a cool she photo. had a lot of abuse for that, mind. Yeah, no one messaged me abusing me, but she had a lot. Really? Yeah, like a um, couple, like, couple of people messaged different things. Um, basically, like asking who she thought she was and something else. And they didn't, didn't reply to me. Everyone was just giving it thumbs up and stuff and no one said anything, but they gave her a bit of shit. Uh, yeah, we just laughed about it, man. I just, good yeah. Time, yeah, good laugh. And we're celebrating, do you know what I mean? Like, that was um, that wrote, that was a legacy fight for me. Like, I've written my le legacy in European martial arts now. And in, in, in the MMA scene, in Cage War Warriors, I'm always going down as the third person to ever do it. The only person to do it at lightweight and more well weight. And, like, there's, there's not many people who can set those standards or can fall into those circumstances. Because a lot of the time, if it had been any other time and it wasn't the COVID rules, it wouldn't have been allowed to happen because it ties up two weight divisions. Yeah. It slows everything down. And unless you're really making waves, it doesn't really happen. And it was just to do with the way I'd done it, the performance I put on before, and then the circumstance with COVID and stuff. Everything ticked my boxes, and I'm always a man to take uh, a chance of circumstance. Yeah, right on, man. That's great. With your uh, relationship with Team Alpha Male as well, like I'm, I was interested in like how that blossomed. Because uh, obviously you've seen, like, I've seen like Corey McKenna as well <laughs> doing a similar thing. Like, how did... How did that like come about? So for me, um, I train under Pedro Bessa. Um, it's my jiu-jitsu team. Um, Nad Narmani trains out of Pedro Bessa. And he had a connect out in Team Alpha Mill, obviously, because he's out there a lot. So I looked into going to the team, um, team, uh, top team, American top team, um, because I trained under one of their affiliates before when I was in Florida when I was younger. So I was like, oh, I'll go to ATT, try them. Um, I trained with Kayla Harrison before when I was in the judo. So I thought, oh, I could drop her a message and go. My coach could, he's closer than I was. Um, and then when I looked into it, they were like, they were quite shady with new fighters coming in. Um, they they usually like, they put you, you have to sort of earn your stripes and you have to go in with the other travelers first and told you things. So I was like, ah, oh, I don't really want to do that. And um, I knew 
knew um, uh, I knew Nad, obviously, and Nad had put a good word in with me at Team Alpha Male, so I dropped them a message, and they was, like, really happy to have me out. So I went out there, and they treated me so well, and I learned so much. Um, I had some, built some really good relationships with some of the guys, especially my weight, like Max Griffin I train with, who's a wild weight. Um, uh, there's... I can't remember his name, he's gonna kill me. Uh, one of my really good friends, I, tra I normally stay with Mike Malott, I'm Chris Gonzalez, that's what I'm thinking <laughs> of, who's like a Bellator, I'm like prospect, tearing through the ranks, really good wrestler, um, I'm really good friends with, like we spend a lot of time together out there and I get some really good rounds with him. And then there's some good strikers who are about my weight and welders, so I get a good mix between lightweights and weights. So obviously Sage is lightweight as well, so it's, it's a perfect place for me to train. And um, I, I like Sacramento, man, nothing really happens, it's quiet, it's really chilled and like, for a training camp, it's perfect because, like Vegas, I think you sort of like it's always you you can get dragged into sort of. I I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't really do drugs, anything like that. I don't go near any of it. But um, Vegas got that sort of nightlife that can drag you in, um, and there's different parts in America where it's easy to just like oh I can go do this and oh I can go do that. Whereas Sacramento, I think the only time we ever we do, we ever spend time on our day offs is we go like scootering through the city. You know what I mean? Everything else is just. And my girlfriend's an ex fighter as well, so. Um, like she was in the Olympic Taekwondo team, did high, high levels for years. Um, she's knocked more people out than I have, my girlfriend has. Yeah, yeah she kicks unbelievably well. So um, I was speaking to Dan on the plane about this actually, Taekwondo. But um, like she's like me, so she just likes to sit, watch training. She'll do some of her uni stuff and chill out. And um, she's just happy to relax. And then maybe like on the weekend when we get a time off, we'll go to the mall, have a quick look around. And then it's back and it's just, it's just a nice time to take a time off. So she was out there with me for a month. Um, and then I stayed for another month and she hadn't jet off home to get back to work and stuff, so. So she, does she like join you training and things like that when she can here and there? Yeah, like she kicks me um, quite a lot uh, at the minute now. Um, she was training for her Thai debut. Um, she's been struggling with the hips for a long time and now she's waiting for surgery on, on, on her hip. So um, after she has the surgery, we'll get back to it and um, she's gonna make a Thai debut, I think. Like she kicks phenomenally well. Like. After every one of my fights, she slates me so bad for my kicker, man. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, obviously, the John Gooden DVD was released on the UFC, and um, I watched one part at the start, and I throw it like a spin hook kick, and it's terrible. My like, balance is better, but my kicking is still not, not there. Like, and I was just thinking, I'm glad she's not here, because she ripped me so bad for that. And she hasn't said anything yet, but I'm just waiting for it. But she rips me so bad. Um, in the Adam Proctor fight, I threw a, a reverse, well, it was a back kick, and um, I was having a little bit of a problem with my back in that fight, before that fight. and. Um, it pulled me off target and he nearly clipped me. And after the fight, she said, um, she said, oh, congratulations. She said, awesome performance, give me a hug and all. And like, I was waiting for it to say something. And we was after, after the fight, we sat there and um, uh, I think I had a couple of slices of pizza, nothing too bad, because I'm trying, I jumped straight back in the diet after the fight. And um, she turned around to me and she said, oh, by the way, she said, if you would go caught after throwing that stupid reverse sidekick, she said, she said, I, I would have asked, do I either finish you or just delete all my Taekwondo friends? She was like, it's embarrassing. I was like, I've just won two titles. <laughs> I throw one kick and she slated me. <laughs> but I I, I, good, I, I, I like criticism. I've yeah. always been nice in criticism. Um, like you I learn from you criticism. Yeah, 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 man. And um, it just drove me to improve a lot more. I'm like, my kicking's going through levels all the time and it's just waiting for me to kick like my hands have. So it's, it's gonna come, it's gonna come. Yeah, that's awesome, man. It's great to hear. So what are some of the differences between like, I know you've mentioned a few of them, but a little bit more specifically, what are more of the benefits you get from training out of America than you do out in Wales? Is it more like the body types and that kind of thing? Um, it's just the amount of pro fighters on the mat. So like I'll train back home and I've got some good training partners around me, but a lot of them got jobs and different things. Like these boys are pure MMA guys. Like I remember when I first went, there was 24, 25 fighters on the mat at one point who was signed to either UFC or Bellator. So in the UK, I think at the minute, there's five or no less than us now. Um, there's four, five of us signed to the UFC. Yeah. Yeah, Brett, Jack, Corey, and me. Yeah. Um, so four, people, four fighters, do you know what I mean? Brett still. Brett, yeah, five, yeah. five. Yeah, yeah, five, there we go. Yeah, it's a nice so, little collection coming out. No, isn't it? Brett's a Bellator. Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah, yeah, yeah Bellator, what, so four thought, UFC, yeah. one Bellator, so. <laughs> Do you mean there's there's not that many people? Um, he, he recently went over to Bellator. Yeah, that's what yeah. I'm he's waiting for his debut, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. He's gonna kill that. Dude. Yeah, yeah. He's really gonna. Kill yeah, that. I I didn't know about his decision at, at the start. I um, I, but after after hearing the reasoning behind it and sort of some of the stuff, I can understand it a lot more. And um, 
it, I think long term it could be really good for him, and I think he's really looked into it. And he's he's a forward thinking guy anyway, so um, any decision he makes is always going to be planned out and planned meticulously. Yeah. So you're fighting Mike Davis, right? How do you envision this fight going? Oh, mate, I can't wait. This is going to be one hell of a fight. So Mike Tavis is a explosive fighter yeah. and he loves striking. He's got good wrestling, good and really good jiu-jitsu, but he likes keeping on, on, on the feet, moves forward in blocks, and he hits hard. And um, like we're going to strike. It's easy as that. I'm not planning on taking him down. Um, he may plan on taking me down if he's scared, but I think he's going to stand. Um, and the two of us are just going to tear it up. And I think I'll, I'll stop him within two rounds. I'll, I think I'll put pressure on him in the first and I'll... I'll see whether he handles it well, and then by the second round, I'll stop him. But I said the same thing about Adam Proctor and the same thing about Joe McColgan. I'm going to put the pressure on him in the first, and then I'll break him in the second, and they both broke in the first. So we'll see if Mac, if um, Mike's got anything about him. But, um, like, he's a dangerous guy, man. Like, he um, he fought Burns, um, took Ben Burns to a second round. Um, he fought Yusuf to a decision, um, and he smashed um, Thomas Sabu or whatever his name was. So... He's no no chump. He's no sort of easy fight. And I wanted a tough first fight, but um, I just don't think he's going to be enough. Is this going to be a quick turnaround for you? I'd never look forward to the, with fights, I guess, because Mike is is a warrior. I mean, he's, he hits hard. He's dangerous. So I'm going to focus on beating Mike, and we'll see when, how, and what happens in that fight. Like, the only time I ever looked forward a bit was the Alexi Mantikivi fight, and I wanted to get him done. And um, I rushed to finish, ended up taking two stupid cuts because he caught me. I, I hit him ev everywhere, and there was two exchanges where he just sort of clipped me with two exchanges and gave me two cuts, just glancing blows, and then that sort of obviously upset my schedule a little bit. So... I just focus on beating guys and beating them in fashion before you look at what's next. Always, yeah. always take the first um, the first challenge, smash that out of the park, and then we'll go from there. Nice. In an ideal world, how many fights would you like this year? In an ideal world, you'll see how many I can get. Put it that way. I um I have no plans to do anything but compete this year. Like um, I had the same last year. I fought in between the Joe McColgan, Adam Proctor, and this fight. I had two weeks off. That's it. Everything else I pushed through. Um, I haven't stopped dieting since um. Well, since the McColgan fight, to be honest. Um, and before that, I was dating from November, so I had two weeks off. Um, and obviously, that was just down to COVID and um, sort of uncertainties on moving forwards. Everything else, I was happy to push through. Um, I've trained through Christmas, I've trained through birthdays, I've trained through holidays. I am that birthday cake in three years because I've trained through my birthday so much. So um, I don't I don't really, really care, we just push through. Yeah, that's good. Do you miss, do you, have you missed a Christmas no. yet through this? Oh yeah, I, I, yeah. Um, after I had a crazy year, didn't I, where I had like six fights or five fights in 12 months and I'm sure I was pushing for a sixth and I took a little bit of an injury so I, I stepped out before I could and that was the 100 card I would have fought on. Um, Cage Warriors 100 yeah, yeah, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I was there for that. But yeah, I've, I've, I've missed a certain amount of Christmases and different things. It doesn't bother me. Like um, this Christmas again, I missed it. Didn't, other me like this is what I'm meant to do this is why I love to win like I'll stay in the gym 24 hours a day even when I have time off I'm in the gym it doesn't bother me at all like um, I'm gonna prove I'm the best fighter on the planet like I believe I am the best fighter on the planet I've just got to prove it to everyone else and within two three years you, you're gonna start to see what I can do yeah, awesome. how do your family like look at you right now in the UFC living the dream mm. is, are they all like um, I imagine they're very proud and very proud yeah um, my brother, my younger brother is crazy about it. Um, my older brother is really supportive as well. Obviously the rest of them all are as well, but um, they sort of, they didn't see the dream as far as I could. So like my dad's known when I when I was a kid, he's always he's always known it was something I was gonna do. And we've always said about it. And people, people used to laugh when I was like 12 years of age telling people I was gonna be in the UFC one day. And um, Is that how long you've had the dream for? Like, yeah, I've been training since I was seven. By the time I was 10, um, we, we knew I was, I was good at what we could do um, and seeing people like Joseph Duffy pushing through the MMA world and everyone had the, uh, their goals set on the UFC and by the time I was 12 that was what I wanted to do uh, and it was just about making it happen so um, that was the whole reason I started judo in the first place was to improve my wrestling um, because obviously wrestling in the UK wasn't that strong at the time so judo was a good supplement and um, it's gone from there. Oh man that's really cool it's inspiring to hear that dude really cool I've got one more question for you. I want to like, I want you to go in, I want you to play it out for me, yeah? Because I found it fascinating. Not because I didn't believe you, but just because it, I just, I was imagining the fight, right? But I, I was reading somewhere that you was, you said that you'd beat Khabib and you wish you could be the first person to beat Khabib. 
I think that's a killer fight, man. I think it's an amazing fight. I wanted to hear like how you kind of envision that fight going if it was to happen. So, obviously, at, at the moment, people watching this would be like, oh, like, how can you look that far ahead? But for me, um, in, in my in my downtime, whenever I get it, if I'm not training for specific specific fights, I like to break down a, other opponents like I could have in my division and stylistically try and figure a way how you would beat him. Um, and I looked at the Habib fight and I th I think there is there is a way to beat him. Like every man is beatable. Obviously, he goes out there and he surprises people how strong he is when he gets hold of him. But everyone sort of backs up. Um, I think you, you have to maintain distance, of course. Because um, like out of ev everyone, the two people who was done the best against him um, was... McGregor did very well, yep. and it was um, Aliquinta, yeah. the real estate. Yeah, the Aliquinta, um, and obviously Aliquinta was a short notice fight. Yeah, it was. Um, but they both went in there with the never die attitude of going in there and trying to hit him as hard as they can, not worrying too much about the takedowns. But every time they get taken down, they sort of work on getting back up and mm -hmm. on on that sort of mentality of surviving all the time. And McGregor was doing well. He, um, was, he just. He was too scared to throw. Like if he'd gone out there with the mentality of dropping bombs, I think it would have been a different fight. Um, as soon as He's Habib gets hold of it, it was different. Well, yeah. And, and Habib started catching him. And that's the thing, like these wrestlers, if you fear what they've got, they'll catch you left, right and center because they've got that raw striking style. And Habib's no champ. Um, obviously Gaethje was just scared from the start and you could tell that and that's not the way to fight. You have to go out there with a mentality of hitting him and hurting him. And um, you have to take it to him without taking it into into a takedown. So it's a difficult thing to do, but yeah, I, th I think I could beat any man on this planet. And there's game plans and ways around ev everyone. The McGregor, for one, um, I love fighting Southpaws. I love fighting Southpaws. I love that fight. Not just because the money, it's just the the goalposts of it, beating someone like that. So um, if when it comes, if, if, if it comes, if they're not done by the time I'm through, then... I'll definitely, like, there's no man in this plan you could say that I wouldn't fight. Like, for everyone, there's, there, there's a weakness. Everyone has. I've got my own. Um, I work. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> the guy who's a bit big. Um, I did make a joke. So, before I got signed to the UFC, I messaged Kareem to ask if there was any update about the UFC. And he said, look, man, we're trying, but nothing's really coming of yet. And um, uh, I can't remember the geezer's name now, but... Um, the, uh, at middleweight, um, it was the guy who had the belt there. Um, he f defended his last fight. I can't remember his name now for Cage Warriors. Um, uh, what's his name? Oh, um, I think I do. In the UFC now? No, in Cage Warriors. In Cage Warriors right in now? In Cage Warriors now with a middleweight title. Um, I can't remember. N uh, Nathan Nath 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 oh. oh, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. yeah. I would just say... Nathaniel Frederick. Fredericks, yeah. Yeah, 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 it's not the final, is it? It's, not, it's so like a weird name, but Fredericks, yeah. So um, I messaged him and said, "Oh, uh, any, any news from the UFC?" And he's like, "No." I was like, "Oh, we want to hurry up because Fredericks is looking beatable right now." And I was joking, obviously, because it wasn't taking that fight. <laughs> because like I weighed in for the um, uh, the welterweight title, like at the same weight as I do lightweight. I um did the same cut, I just did water cut. So I was the same weight I am now wow. in fight week, and um, like I did the cut, and then I remember like I made weight like the night before. Um, and then was just sort of like staying flexible back and forth, back and forth until like it wasn't easy. I still had to do the normal diet and my fast and stuff to make weight, but I didn't get the, I didn't, by the time the water load was done, I was making weight. So um, for me, like I went in that fight as a lightweight and when I hydrated back up and head back up, I, I wouldn't go over 80 kilos. Like the McColgan fight, I was 80, 80 and a half, 81 kilos. So I was actually heavier in my lightweight title fight than I was in the welterweight title fight. That's wild, man. Yeah. That's wild. Dan asked me to ask you as well, actually. Didn't give me any context, but you said ask him about his eye test. Oh, man. So, my eye test for this fight cost me two and a half grand. <laughs> Did it? So, um, like, it wasn't anything to the USC's fault, but they told us to wait and wait and wait and end up working it while they were sorting everything. And then, um, I think, obviously, because of different states, depends on different things. So, he's waiting, and then um, all of a sudden, like, um, they messaged us on a Wednesday and was like, look, can you book your eye test for after the 1st of January, please? So this was like the Wednesday before the New Year. So we didn't have much time. And then when we looked, the first was a Friday, second was a Saturday, and the third was a Sunday. So they were all off. And then the, the Monday was like the fourth and the Tuesday was a fifth. So booking on the fourth was a nightmare. We couldn't find any way to take it. And then I found a place who would do my eye test on the Tuesday. And on the Thursday, I could get my bloods and my medicals and everything else done. So all sorted, we checked the UFC medical. They said, yep, that works fine for us. Perfect. 
all of a sudden UFC travel got involved. It's like, we need you in London on the Wednesday. So it's like, it was like, oh, that's not going to work. Mason's got his, his medicals booked in on Thursday. And he was like, look, we'll have to change your flights. And they were like going through all these things. And then all of a sudden the money was going up and up and up and up. So I was like, look, don't worry about it. I'll move my appointment. So when they reopened, um, uh, after the bank holidays, I rang straight away and I canceled my eye test and moved my bloods from the Thursday to the Tuesday. So then I tried finding a place to get my eye test done on the Tuesday. Couldn't find anywhere. So I messaged Ian. Ian was like, look, I've messaged every single opticians. Or it's not called an opticians. You have to see a specialist, like a special eye doctor in London. Um, and one's got back to me. So um, it was like Moorfield Health. So perfect. Said, come with that. And then... <laughs> Like two days from then to go up, he messages back and says, oh, my normal guy who does eye tests has messaged me back now. So if we needed a reserve, we've got one. And I was like, yeah, cool. We'll go with Moorfield though and go. I wish, I so wish, man, we go with the other one because I went there and they just sort of added costs on top of costs. And like, they made me get a laser on my one eye in the end. They said, um, they said uh, in your past two eye tests, it comes up that you've got, um, uh, I forgot the term they use. It's like, um, it was like a spot at the back of my eye. I was like, yeah, yeah, it's come up. They said there's nothing wrong with it. He said, oh, well, there's nothing really wrong with it, but there's a bit of a wave I'm not too happy about, so I want you to go see my 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 colleague who's an eye specialist to get another opinion. And then I had um, a little bit of a scram on my eye, which wasn't deep at all. Um, seen a doctor and it was all fine. Didn't need stitches, anything. Went to see him. They was like, oh, yeah, we need to see another one of my colleagues who's a... Uh, an eyelid specialist to get a second opinion on that. I was like, all right, here we go. They charged me £400 for the specialist to see the back of my eye. He come in. Um, and said there's, uh, there was a minor tear there, something that's been there for years, like minor, minor, minor tear. I said, well, will it affect me? And he said, no. I said, well, can you sign my form? I said, more field health, we like to go into detail. So um, he made me get a um, tiny bit of laser just to wave that out. And I said, will it like, will it like affect it much? And he was like, like, will the laser help much? And he was like, well, not really, no. He's like, only minor, but I can't sign it off unless it's been treated. Oh, perfect. Then the guy with my, the little scram I had, literally just pulled the, rubbed the alcohol, pulled the scab off completely and reopened it. And then um, looked at it through a light. Said, oh yes, it's not deep. It doesn't need stitches or anything. And then put paper stitches on on, on, on there for me. And was like, oh, here we go. And took 200 pound off me. And then I pay like, um, like a thousand pound for the laser on my one eye, 300 pound for him to do it. Then an extra 200 pound for the guy at the end. So after I'd already paid all this money, I'd pay an extra 200 pound at the end for the guy to, um, to speak to the other two doctors, to write a report up and just to sign my form. And I said, look, I don't need a report. All I need for you to do is to sign the form. So he charged me £200 to sign the form. So um, it was just adding on to costs and costs. But I was just laughing at the end. Like, um, yeah, it was um, sponsorship money I'd had in reserve that I kept back. And it was like the money I'd, I'd had for like six months worth of sponsorship off one of my sponsors was money that I'd, I really could have used somewhere else. But um, I'll win this 50 grand bonus and then uh, they'll cover it, I think. Is that like... Is it distracting when you're like going through that kind of stress? Is it? It's not you. I don't know. It bother me. Um, all I'm at it is is the form got signed at the end of the day, and there was nothing wrong with it. Like stuff like this has always happened to me <laughs> when Cage Warriors um, first brought in the safe MMA checks. I went for my brain scan um, two days after passing my boxing brain scans because I was pro boxing, and then after my fights got cancelled, I switched over quick. Um, and they wouldn't allow my brain scans to carry over. They made me do them again. So I did them all again, no problem. Paid for them again. And um, they, they questioned me on them, pulled me in and said there was, um, there was sort of some in, inadequacies we didn't like and there was sort of errors. And I was like, well, well this can't be possible because I literally just passed my brain scans. And they were like, um, they looked into it and they said, oh, you had a little bit of brain shrinkage. Duh, 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 duh. And I said, well, what's that from? They said, oh, it could be dehydration. Or it could also be from sparring. I said, well, one, I sparred before the brain scans and like the day before, which I won't do now. And two, like, of course I was dehydrated because I've been counting for a fight before the scans come up. And um, they were like, oh yeah, it's no problem. There's nothing actually wrong with you. We just think. And then I had to do my brain scans every year instead of every two years. So I'm used to paying these and having these questions done. But as long as I get ticked off and there's nothing wrong with me and I am healthy, because I have, obviously, as a fighter, I want to look after my long-term health, especially when you see all this stuff about, obviously, people taking brain hits and brain injuries and coming up with these awful diseases and their mentality and their minds going terrible places. And, obviously, like, this happened this week with the murders and stuff. Obviously, it's, it's upsetting to think about. And I, I want to look after my family, and that means staying as healthy as possible. And I, I, I want to enjoy my fame when I get to the top of the tree. Like, I want to retire early and look after myself. So... For me, um, you always got to have an exit plan in place. Um, and for me, being healthy is part of my exit plan. It's a smart exit plan. Yeah, it's a smart exit plan. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much. Thank you ever so much.